The Stamina Arcanist has been under the relentless assault of nerfs since its launch over a year ago, but this class just cannot be killed. Despite the changes in Update 43 that many feared would be the nail in the coffin for their favorite class, an unlikely hero in Writhing Runeblades in Perfected Null Arca have once again created a dominant meta for the Arcanist, at least in terms of single target. This video is designed to be a complete and comprehensive guide to help you find the build that fits your needs and to teach you how to maximize your damage with that build on the dummy and in content. If you're a complete beginner, start right here, where we talk about how to build the Arcanist. If you are a bit more experienced and already have the build squared away, I'd suggest starting in the damage dealing section of the video, where we discuss all elements of doing damage on the Stamina Arcanist, including the fundamentals, our static and dynamic rotations, and a discussion about adapting those rotations for real content scenarios. Finally, if you want access to the full written guide, be sure to join the Discord. The full written guide covers everything discussed in this video, but is an easy way to control F your way to any topic that you might still feel a little uncomfortable on after watching. And with that, we have a lot to discuss, so let's get into it. Getting into the basic build information for the patch, starting with our race options. The uncontested meta for any stam spec is Dark Elf, as it provides both the most max stamina and most weapon and spell damage out of any other choice. This is the race that I use on the dummy and in content. Another benefit to Dark Elf is that it also offers nearly 2k max magicka, making it just as strong of an option for mag specs if you'd like the versatility to be able to switch between builds and still maximize damage. Race plays a very small role in total DPS output though, so if you prefer, Orc is the next best option, giving the same amount of weapon and spell damage with only 1k less max stam, but offering some passive healing to assist with better survivability. High Elf is the next best choice, offering the same amount of weapon and spell damage, but no max stamina. Finally, in solo 4-man or unorganized 12-man content, Khajiit ends up being the strongest choice as it offers some crit damage, a stat that's not necessary when your group is optimized, but the most important stat to make sure that you have enough of. Wood Elf is conceptually the same, but in regards to penetration. You want 125% crit damage and 18,200 penetration in 12-man content to maximize your damage potential, stats that you can't really track in your character sheet, but more so that you should consider by knowing which buffs and debuffs are being provided by your support. For our Mundus, in 99% of situations, the Thief will be the strongest option, giving a ton of critical chance, an essential and particularly difficult stat to source. In very rare situations, you might consider running either the Lover or the Shadow. The Lover offers some penetration to help hit that 18200 cap, and the Shadow is particularly good when running Mechanical Acuity, since this set will get your crit chance to nearly 100% anyway. Taking a look at our attributes, we will spec all 64 points into stamina. It shouldn't be necessary for the sake of sustain or survivability to allocate these points anywhere else, so we'll take the highest damage gain that we can by making our stam pool as high as possible. Taking a look at our consumables, starting with food and drink choices, there are a few options that you should be aware of. The most common choice in content especially are the blue buy stat foods, which offer nearly 5k of both max health and max stam. This will increase our damage by raising our stamp pool and give us a ton of survivability, amplifying our health pool as well. That said, this will not be the strongest option for damage potential, as the green max stam food options will give 1k more max stamina, and therefore give an extra 1-2k DPS on average. If you're interested in this high-risk, mild-reward trade-off, you're welcome to use this food. However, we really only ever see it run on dummy parses, but this is in fact the food that we use on the dummy for our Fate Carver build. I really want to stress, even in some recent trial records that I've been a part of, nobody used this food, so the trade-off really is minimal. However, our Rune Blades build is far more demanding on our stamina pool, and we won't be able to sustain either Green Max Resource or the Blue by step food options on the dummy. Instead, we will opt for Lava Foot, which offers a fair amount of max stam, though slightly less than that of even by step food, but gives a ton of stamina recovery. At the end of the day, you can't do damage if you can't cast abilities, so ensuring that we can sustain this rotation is going to be far more beneficial than increasing our stam pool by 1-2k. to Sustaining on the dummy is far more difficult than sustaining in content, so you should be able to run the buy stat options in Dungeons and Trials. But if you find your stam sustain to still be an issue, your final consideration should be Arteum Takeaway Broth, which offers a lower amount of stam and stamina recovery than Lava Foot, but gives max health, creating a happy balance between damage, sustain, and survivability. 
For our potions this patch, the uncontested meta for the arc are heroism potions. These restore both mag and stam, give the major mag and stam recovery buffs, which increase both recovery pools by 30%, and offer minor heroism, which speeds up our ult gen. The main damage increase on the dummy is seen with these potions because they allow our languid eye to perfectly line up with the consistent off-balance procs that we get on the dummy, a damage amplifier when running the exploiter CP. This is pretty much a free 2 to 3k extra DPS when performing the rotation correctly. The benefit in content is a bit more obvious. Oftentimes when using heroism potions, we can get an extra ultimate in a fight where we might not otherwise, whether it be a full extra languid eye to boost our damage another 2 to 3k, or even a dawnbreaker which will still give us an extra 1 to 2k. The only point to keep in mind is that most classes historically run spell or weapon damage potions, which are one of few sources in the game of major sorcery and brutality, the weapon and spell damage buffs, and major prophecy and savagery, the weapon and spell crit buffs. These buffs are essential, a must-have. On the arc, we can source the damage buffs with the skill Inspired Scholarship and the crit buffs with the skill Camouflaged Hunter, so there is quite literally no damage downside to running Heroism Pots. The only major pain is the fact that they are very expensive to craft, requiring Dragon Room, Dragon's Blood, and Columbine. If you find Heroism Pots to be too expensive, you can't go wrong with simple Tristat Potions to make sure that you have a way to restore both resource pools and get both of the major recovery buffs. You can craft these by combining Columbine, Bugloss, and Mountain Flower. As a final alternative, if for whatever reason you are not sourcing the aforementioned damage and crit buffs with Scholarship and Camo Hunter, you must run the weapon damage potions, which offer major brutality, savagery, and restore stamina, as well as give the major stam recovery buff. You can craft these by combining Blessed Thistle, Dragonthorn, and Wormwood, or you can purchase the Alliance Battle Drafts from Cyrodiil. Finally, for our champion points, this gets a little tricky since the Arcanist has two primary setups. For our dummy setup with Rune Blades, we will opt to run Deadly Aim, Master at Arms, Wrathful Strikes, and Exploiter. Exploiter provides the strongest damage increase out of any CP option, but has some tough conditions to make it worthwhile. Keeping the highest possible uptime on Exploiter isn't always the best way to use it. For example, on Chimera, proccing Exploiter while everyone is going out of group to place Meteors is a waste of a proc, and wasting Exploiter procs makes running other alternative CP more worthwhile. In addition to this, DDs need to somewhat track Exploiter to maximize damage with the CP, which is nearly impossible to do on console because tracking the cooldown requires all buffs to be turned on. This makes it incredibly difficult to spot the single icon that you need to locate among the masses. For most players, it will be worth simply dropping the CP in content. Exploiter shines though in trash pools when skills like Scythe on a Crow are being used to provide AoE off balance instantly. In short pools, you end up getting all of the benefits of Exploiter without the hindrances of uptimes or brain power to worry about. The two primary damage CP, Deadly Aim and Master at Arms, have pretty much the same function. Most of the damage in this version of the build deal primarily single target and or direct damage, including our set, Null Arca, our Light Attacks, Rune Blades, and our Monster, which, altogether, make up 60-70% to 70 of our overall DPS output. Finally, since such a large percentage of our overall damage is buffed by the previously mentioned CP, Wrathful Strikes will be the next strongest damage option. There aren't any major sources of AoE or damage over time effects, so we settle for a CP that will buff 100% of our damage at a slightly lower value than the buffs provided by champion slottables like Biting Aura or Thaumaturge, which would buff a lower percentage of our overall DPS output as a whole. For the Fate Carver setup though, we will recycle Exploiter and Wrathful Strikes, but opt to use Biting Aura and Thaumaturge instead of Deadly and Master. Thaum will be our strongest raw damage CP option for this setup. This champion point will buff nearly every single source of damage in this toolkit, including our primary spammable. Thaum usually only buffs around 40% of our total damage output on other classes, but thanks to this unique spammable on the Arcanist, it will buff somewhere between 80 to 90% of our total damage output. Fighting Aura is in a very similar boat, Though not buffing every skill, it also does buff Fate Carver, making this selection a no-brainer. As some alternative CP to consider, when choosing to drop Exploiter, Untamed Aggression will get you the next best damage increase. This CP works like Wrathful, but offers a little bit less weapon and spell damage. The concept works the same. Each setup has very few damage types, so we settle for a CP that will buff 100% of our damage at a slightly lower value than the buff provided by a full damage CP, as opposed to buffing a much smaller percentage of our DPS output at a slightly higher value individually. Finally, as some optimization CP to be aware of, in optimization situations that leave you a bit under pen, you can choose to run Force of Nature in place of either Exploiter or Wrathful. This CP gives about 660 pen per status effect, which, in an organized group, should reliably give you an 
an average of nearly 2k extra penetration over the course of an entire fight. In situations where you might be under the crit cap, you can opt to run either Backstabber or Fighting Finesse to compensate. Backstabber should be run in fights where you can consistently flank the boss, that is, stand behind it for the entire duration of a fight, and Fighting Finesse should be used when you cannot accomplish this. Getting into the gear information section, I'm going to discuss the most relevant gear combinations for the Stam arc, including our dummy setup, a generic content setup for 12 man, the Azur setup, and the Trash setup, as well as discuss alternate sets that can be run instead of the given ones for each build. Finally, we'll end the section by discussing the miscellaneous set strong enough to be considered meta, or even other good sets that might be a bit easier to obtain than the trial sets. The skills are included with each build, but we will talk about the skills and alternatives with great detail in the next section of the video. Starting with our dummy setup, this will be the best gear combo for the 21 mil dummy and any pure single target fight that you encounter in 12 man. We will opt to run the new craftable set from Westwild Highland Sentinel on the body, perfected slivers of Null Arca on the front bar daggers and jewelry, the Saloon monster set and the perfected maelstrom greatsword on the back bar. Starting with our first set coming from the brand new trial Lucent Citadel, perfected Null Arca is uniquely strong on the Arcanist with Rune Blades. This set procs after doing crit damage three times with a five second cooldown. Normally we can expect about 8k DPS out of this set, but since Rune Blades fires three times in a one second window with an extremely high chance to crit, we can proc this set almost instantly on cooldown when prioritizing it. This results in Null Arca nearly doubling its damage, outputting up to 14k DPS. In order to get this type of damage, you need both a little luck and really good rune blades timing, prioritizing casts of this ability over anything else whenever this set is off cooldown. Even without doing so though, you'll still get more single target damage out of this build than with the Fate Carver setup that we'll discuss shortly. Our second 5 piece Highland Sentinel is a craftable introduced in Gold Road that offers an ungodly amount of critical chance, which builds at 357 per stack, stacking up to 10 times. The catch is that anytime you move, you lose 5 stacks. This makes the set pretty niche, but usable in probably 60% of trial content with some practice and mastery. Most of which I would say is older content, such as Kind's Aegis, Sunspire, or most fights in the Halls of Fabrication. However, it still can be used in fights like Zalvaka or Teleria in newer content as well. When at 10 stacks, we will have over 75% critical chance on the Arcanist, which is absolutely mind-blowing. Even at that, losing stacks of the set is not quite as detrimental as it seems. If you are not auto-walking on PC on the dummy, Stampede will occasionally cause stacks of the set to drop. So we end up getting that penalty a few times throughout the parse and are still able to pull off damage far stronger than any setup can even come close to. Next up from the dungeon Selene's Web, Selene is the strongest monster that we can use on the dummy. This set procs on martial melee damage, which means that every light attack we throw has a chance to proc it. We will get up to an astounding 8k DPS from this set, making Selene comparable to full 5-piece sets like Reliquin in terms of DPS output, in addition to getting a line of weapon and spell damage, which becomes a tad more preferable than the usual line of crit chance we'd aim for when not using a set like Highland Sentinel. Finally, the Perfected Maelstrom's Greatsword adds 560 damage to all of our direct damage attacks. While this description ends up being a bit ambiguous, the damage increase in actuality ends up being very significant, especially with setups like this that have over 60% of its DPS output dealt through direct damage. We end up getting a massive buff to our main set, Rune Blades, Flail, and our light attacks just to name a few. If you don't want to concern yourself with tracking Null Arca to attempt to maximize the damage done with the set, as it can be very tricky, you can opt to run Perfected Arms of Reliquin instead. This set procs simply on light attacks, providing a damage debuff that ticks once per second, stacking up to 10 times. These stacks only last for 4 seconds though, and we would run Reliquin on the front bar, so that means that we have to ensure that we are casting a skill light attack combo on our front bar once every 3 seconds. You should be able to achieve this pretty naturally, but in content, if there are any invuln phases or mechanics on a boss that would cause the stacks to drop, you probably will want to avoid this set, despite it being a bit easier to maximize damage with compared to Null Arca. Our next setup focuses on a build that's going to be a bit more mainstream for all content. There are very few pure single target fights in the game that you would want to run the previous setup in, and the arc quite uniquely has some of the strongest AoE damage in the game. To unleash this potential, we will use Perfected Coral Riptide on the body, Deadly Strikes on the weapons and jewelry, the Velothier Mage's Amulet, the Perfected Maelstrom's Inferno Staff, and One Piece Slimecrawl. 
From the trial Dreadsail Reef, Perfected Coral Riptide is one of, if not the strongest set that we can use on the Arcanist. In this build, we will opt to use the skill Exhausting or Pragmatic Fate Carver, which will end up accounting for over 45% of our total damage output on its own. When you have a class that does a lot of damage, and especially does most of its damage with just a few abilities, buffing those abilities will be the best way to increase your damage, as opposed to running proc sets that do good damage on their own. Riptide is one of, if not the strongest set in the game for accomplishing this, providing nearly 800 weapon and spell damage when your stamina is below 33%. The Arcanist sustain is really good, which means we can dump our stamina to this threshold before a fight and easily maintain this value while still having stamina to perform important functions like block or dodge without ever running out of resources. Of course, this sometimes takes some practice and content, but it's extremely doable. From the Bruma Vendor in Cyrodiil, we will most commonly choose to pair this set with Deadly Strikes. We will run Deadly for the same reason conceptually that we choose to run Riptide, offering a flat 15% damage increase to our channeled abilities. This includes our primary spammable and highest source of damage, Fate Carver. Pairing these sets results in getting some astounding numbers out of this ability. Our mythic for this build, the Velothier Mage's Amulet, is a pretty strong set that offers a decent bit of penetration, minor force, but most importantly, a 15% damage done increase. This is at the cost of your light attack damage though, as the amulet reduces the damage of them by 99%. Since we have a five and a half second channeled spammable, we will be light attacking way less often on the Arcanist compared to other classes, making our light attack damage account for a much smaller amount of our overall DPS output, and therefore making the penalty a bit less severe. Take for example, a class like the DK. Running this mythic on this class would encompass a 7-10% DPS loss from our light attack damage, which we would trade for that 15% damage done bonus, resulting in a net 5-8% damage increase from the mythic. On the Arcanist though, our light attacks only make up 2-5% of our overall DPS output, meaning that the trade-off in damage is only a couple percent, making Velothi far more worthwhile. Our backbar arena weapon, the Maelstrom Inferno with Wall of Elements is one of the strongest AoE sets in the game. Running this weapon will cause Wall of Elements to deal nearly 11k DPS, stronger than that of full proc sets like Reliquin by a mile, which not only results in strong single target damage, but strong AoE as well since the size of Wall is so big and can hit so many things, more than really any other ability in the game. Finally, since we are running a Mythic and Arena Weapon combo, we will have room for a One Piece Monster bonus. Slimecrawl will be the strongest option, providing a line of crit chance, the strongest One Piece bonus in the game, at a value oddly higher than that of any other monster set. Every single monster in the game that offers a line of crit chance gives 657 of it, but Slime Craw gives 771 for some odd reason, making it meta. If you don't want to worry about the stam management minigame that comes with Perfected Coral Riptide, you can instead opt to run either Perfected Whirl of Depths on the weapons and jewelry, moving Deadly Strikes to the body for this setup, or Perfected Onsoul's Torment in its place, with this set outright replacing Riptide on the body. From the trial Dreadsail Reef, Perfected Whirl of Depths is a versatile light armor set that does 8 to 10k DPS in a large AoE radius. Whirl is the next strongest trial set that we can pair with Deadly Strike. Unfortunately, the set does proc off of light attacks, which can get a little tricky to maintain on the Arcanist. We typically want to avoid light attack based sets on this class as micromanaging these types of sets while maintaining a skill that channels for 5.4 seconds has a very high skill gap. That said, due to World's extremely long timer, even if you aren't actively tracking it, you will still get really solid damage. This build is very strong and was even used on Teleria to take the VDSR console record. So really, if you don't like Riptide, this setup is fine. Our other alternative coming from the trial Sanity's Edge, Perfected Onsoul's Torment offers a 7% damage done bonus which doubles to 14% after getting an interrupt. On average, both Riptide and Whirl will give more overall damage than Onsoul. The only exceptions are fights like the first and maybe final boss of Sanity's Edge that offer plenty of chances to interrupt something. If you are in a fight where you can maintain the 14% damage done increase even somewhat consistently, Onsoul will be a stronger overall option. You can also run Onsoul over Riptide with pretty high success if you simply aren't interested in playing that resource minigame that makes Riptide so strong, and if you also don't want to keep track of world procs. Our next build is one that has made the Arcanist meta for so long. The classic Azur build utilizes most of the same sets from our generic content setup, but instead of Deadly Strikes, we will use Azur Blight Reaper, running the set on the body and moving Perfected Coral Riptide to the front bar. From the dungeon layer of Marsalok, this set is the absolute strongest AoE DPS option in the game. 
to break down its functionality, Azure is best used in fights with two or more priority targets. The value increases the more targets there are, but this is dependent on those targets' health. It will only be worth using Azure in situations where targets have enough health to get this set to proc at least once, and can be held close enough together to ensure that the bomb hits all intended targets. Take for example a fight like Oak's Hard Mode. There are constantly at least two priority targets, but the short radius of Azure makes it a little difficult to consistently ensure that the bomb will hit those targets to have its damage amplified. There are a ton of low health frogs that spawn in throughout the fight, but their low health will never really allow Azure to build and proc since they are almost always killed instantly. These conditions make Azure not really worth running on this boss. On the next fight, boss A, however, there's always at least a flesh atro or a fire behemoth stacked near the main boss throughout this entire encounter. Each of these targets has enough health to get multiple procs of Azure before it's killed. Running this set on boss A is a no-brainer, and that's about where the discussion ends for PC, but this opens up some unique optimization arguments for console specifically. While the set may be really good on a fight like boss A, it's just not good on Oaks. But we have to weigh which is worth more, swapping the set on and off for one fight, or taking the damage loss on a fight like Oaks for the sake of saving swap time. This will depend on the group's speed in swapping and the group's goals in general. A final note about the set's functionality, since there can only be one Azure proc at a time, and there is a limit to how quickly stacks can be applied, your group's benefit from people running this set will cap out at around 6 players, maybe 7, as this is about the point in which Azure is constantly and consistently procking. Adding an 8th DD won't make it go any faster and will begin to result in some losses. For our trash setup, though there are a ton of different pairings that you can use to maximize your damage pull to pull on PC especially, I'm going to give you the best generic trash setup that will work well on every pull. Looking back at our content build, all we have to do is replace Perfected Coral Riptide with a set from the Trial Rock Grove, Perfected Soulzon's Torment. Soulzon is one of the strongest sets in the game, but it's just a bit niche. In trash pulls, maximizing our damage will be done most efficiently by using our spammables as often as possible. For this reason, getting big numbers in trash is largely up to crit chance. Solzon gives a ton of both crit chance and crit damage, two essential stats that are a bit more difficult to come by in such short pulls. Whenever we kill a target, including a small 200k health add, a blue beam appears from the corpse, and walking over this gives us these buffs. Trash pulls offer the best opportunity to keep the buffs from this set active consistently. All of these elements together makes souls on for trash a no-brainer. To finish off this section, I'd like to briefly talk about some honorable mentions that you can use instead of the given set options with great success or that may even be situationally meta depending on the fight. Starting off with an easy option, Order's Wrath is a really strong craftable set whose location lies in the High Isle Zone. This set offers a ton of crit chance and crit damage, two essential and particularly difficult stats to come by in the early game especially, making this a go-to replacement for trial sets if you don't have access to them in these setups yet. This set can also be purchased from Guild Traders. Another craftable from the Clockwork City, Mechanical Acuity is a really strong burst set that's good to have access to for certain trash pulls or even boss type encounters. On tough ad pulls that require massive burst, you can pair Mechanical Acuity with a set like Soulzon in Acuity Bomb Trash, dumping your ultimate and using your spammables with perfect crit, which can result in anywhere from 400 to 600k AoE DPS in an extremely short period of time. This set has a pretty long cooldown though, so you have to be selective when choosing which pulls to use use this setup in. Think detrimental trash pulls such as the pull before Fallgraven in VKA, the pull before Boss A in VRG, or the pull before Teleria in VDSR. This set can even be used in incredibly short boss fights that last around 15 seconds or less, and was one of the sets we used while pushing the console record in the Halls of Fabrication. As a note for maximum optimizations, you'll want to run double swords in this setup as well as infused body pieces, as Divine's body pieces with the Thief Munda Stone and daggers just increase our crit chance, a stat that's brought up to 100% with mech acuity. Divine's is redundant with this set, so increasing your resource pool is the next best DPS increase that you can utilize with your gear pieces. This is only true though when a fight lasts for just the duration of an acuity proc. If your fight time involves any moment where acuity is down, you don't want to be damaging a boss with 30% crit chance, so you should stick with the Thief and Divines in fights longer than 6 seconds but shorter than 15. Discussing more monster and arena weapon options, Zahn comes from the dungeon scale caller peak and provides the next best overall single target damage after Selene for the Runeblade's arc. Zahn's proc conditions are simple, requiring a light attack to crit, which causes a fiery beam to tether to your target. This beam ramps up in damage over 10 seconds and afflicts your target with burning, resulting in a max tick of 22k. Its one piece is also a line of crit, which is usually one of the best stat lines in the game. The damage itself is worth about 2-3k less DPS than Selene, but because of the extra up 
times we get with Burning and its One Piece, Zahn ends up being just a hair behind for single target. While the set can provide some AoE damage, it's not reliable, and Zahn does require you to be somewhat in melee range. If you need AoE damage or cannot stay within melee range of your target, I'd suggest using something different. Next up from the dungeon March of Sacrifices, Baylorg is a set used to maximize single target burst damage. This set offers weapon and spell damage equal to the amount of ult you consume, and physical and spell penetration 23 times the amount of ult you consume. Ideally, for a burst fight such as the Spider in Vhoff or the Snake in VRG, you would save 500 ultimate for the beginning and get the massive weapon and spell damage and penetration increase that the set would provide for an ulti that large for about the entire duration of the fight. There are very few situations where this is possible as those buffs only last 12 seconds. But in the fights mentioned, that's about how long you either have to do damage to the target before it becomes invulnerable or about how long the fight should last anyway. As a final monster option to consider, when you are running an arena weapon plus mythic setup, you will have room for a one piece monster bonus. If for whatever reason, you are short on penetration due to the raid comp and or poor optimization, you can opt to run one piece of any monster set that offers a line of pen to get closer to that 18,200 cap. Finally, for the Arcanist, there is really only one arena weapon that we might consider running over the VMA Inferno or the VMA Greatsword. That weapon is the Master's Bow. This set gives 330 weapon and spell damage to targets infected by Poison Arrow. This makes the Master's Bow more preferable in short and bursty situations so that we can increase the damage of our Languid Eye and Fate Carver a bit more. These two skills will account for more and more of our overall DPS output the shorter the fight. In a 15 second mini boss fight, these two skills alone can even make up over 85% of our overall DPS output, so doing everything that we can to add damage to these two skills becomes worthwhile. Another unique situation that I've gotten a ton of use from the Master's Bow on is a fight like Chimera Hard Mode in VSE. This fight's damage phase lasts for about 90 seconds, and optimizing a raid comp that can do this fight in one phase involves adding sets that give your group a ton of ultimate. When the group comp is not optimized in this way, you can only get about two, maybe three languid eyes off in that window of time. When the comp is spec'd for this though, with sets like Pillager and Crypt Cannon, you can get 4 maybe even 5 Languid Eyes in that minute 30 second window. This means that your ultimate will account for an even larger percentage of your overall DPS output than it normally does, which makes Chimera another situation where your Fate Carver and Languid Eye ends up accounting for a huge amount of our DPS output. Buffing up these two skills as much as possible makes the Master's Bow very competitive, if not worth running over our other options. These concepts can be applied to far more fights than the existing examples given here, so be sure to consider these ideas when choosing your arena weapon. Getting into our primary skills, these are the skills that we use on the dummy, acting as the highest potential DPS options for a pure single target fight in a perfect world with perfect uptimes. This is by no means the bar setup that we will use in every fight, but rather will act as a baseline to help us make good decisions when optimizing our bar setups fight to fight based on the flex skill options that we will discuss right after. So with that, starting on the front bar with Barb Trap. The ability itself provides about 4 to 4.5k DPS between the dot and damage on application, but also increases our chance to apply the hemorrhaging status effect, which accounts for another 2k DPS on this class. This means Trap provides a total of about 6k DPS, making it one of the stronger abilities in the game. This skill will also increase our damage done on this bar thanks to the Fighter's Guild passive Slayer, which increases weapon and spell damage by 3% per Fighter's Guild ability slotted. Trap's final use is the fact that it provides minor force, a buff essentially essential to our damage output. This is only relevant when not using the Velothia or Mage's Amulet though, since this mythic provides the same buff at a more consistent rate. Deadly Cloak is a strong damage over time effect, especially near the end of a fight, as the dual wield passive Slaughter increases the damage of this ability by 20% against enemies under 25% health. This will result in a max tick of about 13k, in a total DPS value of roughly 5 to 6k damage per second. In addition to this, Cloak is even more unique on the Arcanist as it can help proc the Flame and Poison enchants on your front bar when using Fake Carver without having to light attack. Every weapon skill helps to proc that weapon's enchant, so running an extremely strong skill like Cloak on its own, in addition to having this bonus, makes it a must-have. Finally, outside of its raw damage, Cloak also gives you Major Evasion, reducing damage taken from area of effect attacks by 20%, which is a super nice buff to have for so many fights in the game. On the dummy, Writhing Runeblades is our spammable of choice for the Arcanist, and will be the primary reason that we can run Nolarka with such great success. This ability takes three times 
times in a one second window with each tick hitting for up to 19k, resulting in a total of nearly 30k DPS with this ability alone over the course of an entire fight. That is an insane amount of damage that we can get out of just one skill. Part of its strength is the fact that it gets between 1000 to 2200 weapon and spell crit rating as well as does 3% increased damage for each active crux. When running rune blades, we will also opt to run Tentacular Dread. This ability is our source of Abyssal Ink, a debuff that increases our damage done by 5% to inflicted targets. This morph also does up to 20% increased damage when consumed with 3 crux as well as increases the damage done with Abyssal Ink by 2% per crux consumed. Since Writhing Runeblades builds crux, we need a skill that consumes crux. In order to make use of the Arcanist passives, Hideous Clarity, which restores resources whenever we build crux, Faded Fortune, which increases crit damage by 12% for 7 seconds when building or consuming crux, and Implacable Outcome, which generates 4 ultimate whenever we consume crux. For this reason, we will want to cast this ability roughly once every 8 seconds to make sure that we are getting the most out of all these passives. Finally, the ability itself is also very strong, coming in with a max tick of about 85k, resulting in 8k DPS over the course of an entire fight. Camo Hunter acts as our primary source of major savagery, the weapon crit chance buff since we are running heroism pots and not receiving this buff from our potions. Camo Hunter also buffs our front bar abilities through the Slayer passive in the Fighter's Guild tree like Trap. Finally, in content, whenever flanking a target, we get Minor Berserk, increasing our damage done by 5%. This is a buff most typically provided by the healer's combat prayer. However, since combat prayer is not a smart target, Camo Hunter helps ensure more consistent uptimes on this buff. For our ultimate on the front bar, we will slot Flawless Dawnbreaker for the Slayer passive as mentioned with Trap and Camo Hunter. That said though, if you do get a Dawnbreaker back at the end of a fight and know that you won't get your primary ultimate back with its full duration, you can cast this instead for a little extra burst as the fight concludes. Moving on to the back bar, starting with Inspired Scholarship. This is one of the stronger dots on this class, outputting around 5k DPS, coming in with a max tick of 22k. The tooltip is a little confusing, so to explain, think of the pulse that the skill is mentioning as a stack, like a Crux on the Arcanist or a Seething Fury stack on the DK for example. The Pulse from Scholarship activates once every 3 seconds, and any damage done with the class ability consumes this stack, which is when Scholarship actually does its damage. This does not stack though, so if you go 2 pulses without doing damage with a class ability, like Rune Blades, Dread, or Fulminating Rune, you lose out on its damage. These 3 class abilities are enough to keep pretty consistent damage with Scholarship without really having to micromanage the skill, so this won't affect our basic rotation. This ability also builds crux whenever our class abilities do damage, when we have zero crux active. This isn't very relevant for the runeblade setup, but is one of the most fundamental components of the fate carver setup. Finally, scholarship also provides major sorcery and brutality, the spell and weapon damage buff to both bars for simply being slotted. In combination with its solid damage and crux gen, scholarship becomes a must have when running heroism or tripods to ensure that we are getting this buff consistently. Stampede is another really strong dot in this toolkit with an initial strike that is a guaranteed crit, hitting for up to 30k, providing about 2k DPS over the course of a fight and whose dot has a max tick of about 6.5k, dealing roughly 4-5k to 5K damage per second over the course of a fight. Altogether, this skill will do about 6-8k to 8K total DPS, making it comparable in raw damage output to a full set like Selene. That said, Stampede is furthermore essential in this setup, as casting the skill procs the effects of the Maelstrom Greatsword for 18 seconds, dramatically increasing near nearly every ability's damage in this toolkit. It's important to note that even though the damage of this skill is very strong, we mainly use it for the associated arena weapon. Stampede lasts for 15 seconds, and the VMA Greatsword's effects lasts for 18, so it's okay to let Stampede drop for a second or two if something more important, like a Null Arca proc for example, needs to be applied. Our flex slot on this class we take up with Carve, the strongest flex option that we have for single target damage in the game. This ability ticks for up to 10k per second, resulting in about 3-4k DPS over the course of a fight, in addition to dealing up to 35k on initial cast, which adds another 1k DPS, bringing our total for this ability to roughly 4-5k DPS over the course of an entire fight. This seems a little weak, but the main value of Carve is found in its duration. This skill lasts up to 32 seconds 
which means that we will get quite a few more spammable casts over the course of a 2-3 minute fight, when compared with other flex dots that might do slightly more damage but have much shorter timers. When such a large portion of your DPS output is compromised of your spammable, longer dots are going to be the play. Another strong class ability that will run for the arc, Fulminating Rune is an often underestimated skill. The value of the dot itself provides about 3.5 to 4k DPS with a max tick of 9k. Fulminating Rune also does an AoE burst after 5 seconds, ticking for up to 32k, resulting in another 1k DPS bringing the total value of this dot up to about 5k DPS between these two elements. In addition to this, this ability also offers one of, if not the strongest damage synergy in the game. The Rune Break synergy becomes available to your allies while the skill is active, and it does a ton of damage in a decent sized AoE radius, ticking for around 30 to 40k in content depending on group buffs. Finally, Fulminating Rune also helps proc extra ticks of scholarship. Whenever we are not using our spammable, ensuring that Scholarship does not miss out on ticks of damage. Our last skill, Camo Hunter, we have slotted on the back bar just to make sure that we don't lose our crit chance bonuses while bar swapping. You can use this slot as a flex skill for abilities that you won't be casting very often, like maybe Echoing Vigor, or for abilities that have long timers, such as Cruxweaver, for example. So with that, our ultimate of choice for the Arcanist, the Languid Eye is simply one of the strongest ults in the entire game. For the sake of comparison, we get to use an ultimate like Meteor just as many times as the Languid Eye throughout the course of a parse. With those four casts, Shooting Star provides roughly 5k DPS, and the Languid Eye provides about 8 to 9k DPS. The burst from this ult is utterly insane, and I've seen peaks at the beginning of a parse on the 21 mil reach as high as 190k. This morph ticks once every half second at a max tick of 38k for 7 seconds, and ramps up in damage as the timer progresses. The only drawback to this ultimate, however, is its radius. It is pretty small, and if you're in a mobile AoE fight, it has to be well-placed and well-timed, as missing targets or having enemies run out of the small radius will result in a pretty massive DPS loss. Now that we've established the most common bar setup for the Arcanist, we can talk about some of the alternative skills that can be used instead to create different bar setups that will satisfy content-specific needs, or even help you to build a bar setup that fits your own playstyle. Starting off with what will likely be the most common bar setup in content, we will make a few changes to maximize our AoE damage in all encounters. We will choose to run Exhausting Fate Carver in place of Writhing Rune Blades and the other morph of Tentacular Dread, Sephiliarch's Flail, on the front bar. And on the back bar, we will run Elemental Blockade and Scalding Rune in place of Stampede and Carve. Exhausting Fate Carver is by far the best ability in the game for any fight that requires remotely any AoE damage. Ticking 3 times per second at a max hit of 45k, Fate Carver does over 50k damage per second and accounts for about 40-45% to of our overall damage output in this setup. Maximizing damage with Fate Carver requires that you consume 3 Crux, as this skill increases in damage by 33% per Crux consumed. This morph also increases the duration, allowing you to get even more ticks out of the skill, and therefore, even more damage. It is what makes the Arcanist truly feel unlike any other class. The amount of damage that the skill does makes doing good damage on the Arc simple, but maximizing damage on the Arc pretty tricky, especially in content. For example, having to cancel the book to handle a mechanic results in a pretty massive damage loss. It's not enough of a loss that you'll be doing significantly less damage than those around you. However, with some practice and experience in a fight, you'll be able to anticipate these mechanics, and you'll make sure that you don't put yourself in a situation where you have to cancel Fate Carver. The AoE potential for this class is insane with this skill as well, since the beam is long enough to hit an entire string of targets with proper positioning. Sephiliarch's Flail is another extremely important skill in this setup. There are a few components to this ability. First of all, the skill itself does damage on impact, resulting in up to a 51k tick, making it a pretty decent burst ability on its own. This will result in roughly 6-7k DPS over the course of an entire fight. Targets hit with flail are also marked with abyssal ink. This debuff increases your damage done by 5% to afflicted targets. Finally, possibly its most important use, this is the primary skill that we will use to build up to 3 crux before casting Fate Carver. When used in combination with Scholarship, we will cast Flail 2 times before every book cast to ensure that we are at 3 full crux to make our Fate Carver damage as strong as possible. Outside of these components, Flail also acts as a pretty decent heal, again being one that can be incredibly min-maxed in certain scenarios. Because of this skill, you likely do not need to lose a 
bar slot in favor of a skill like Echoing Vigor in solo-type portal situations like VSS or VCR portals. In fact, with enough practice, this skill alone is good enough to be used to clear something like boss A hard mode portals as well. Something like this can be very tricky, but it is extremely doable. On the back bar, Elemental Blockade is one of the most important dots in this toolkit for a few reasons. One of its primary usages is as a source of consistent burning, as well of elements, has a 100% increased chance to apply status effects, thanks to the Elemental Force passive in the Destruction Staff tree. On top of this massive perk, Wall itself does a ton of damage, especially when combined with the VMA Inferno, which allows Wall to tick for up to 15k, resulting in about 10k DPS over the course of a fight. This pair makes Wall one of the strongest AoE dots in the game, with the only stronger skill on this class being Fate Carver. Scalding Rune will be the best flex option that we can run for boss damage on this class for a few reasons. First off, this ability ticks for about 2.5k DPS for its damage over time effect, maxing at 7k per tick, as well as does very strong burst damage on impact ticking for up to 65k, resulting in another 2.5k DPS over the course of a fight. The value of the skill is amplified tremendously if you can get it to hit multiple targets, but it has a very tiny radius, so I don't find this component reliable. Scalding Rune can also slightly assist in keeping better uptimes with Burning, the strongest status effect that we can source thanks to its flame damage component. We mainly run this skill though due to its duration and the fact that it's a Magicka-based ability. Scalding will do about as much DPS as any other alternative that we could run, but it lasts long longer than any of those flex options. Abilities with longer durations means that we can use our spammables more often, which is the key to doing good damage on this class. Finally, on the Stamina Arcanist, running a mag-based ability will make Stam Sustain easier, making maintaining a set like Coral Riptide far more manageable. When running the Azer Blight setup though, we will make one small swap. We should replace Scalding Rune with Anti-Cavalry Caltrop, since it will do roughly the same amount of damage per second, but in a much larger radius, which, in an AoE situation, will result in more overall damage. Unfortunately, this ability lasts about half as long as Scalding Rune and costs stamina, but those cons are outweighed by the AoE relevance of the ability in addition to the fact that it helps build Azure stacks far more consistently. Its ability to do so is the main reason we run Caltrops when using Azure, since getting the set to proc as often as possible is the key to max maximizing damage in this build. The next bar setup worth discussing are the skills that we swap out for trash pulls. On console, you'll have to make good decisions about what skills are worth swapping depending on if a boss has any sort of spawn time. The best example might be a fight like Rakat, the final boss in the Maw of Lorkash. When you walk into the room, the boss animation takes about 20 seconds to complete before Rakat is even damageable, giving you plenty of time to swap as many skills as your heart desires. This is opposed to a fight like Yandir, the first boss in VKA, where you walk into the room and the boss is immediately damageable. Swapping out one or two skills in situations like Yandir will almost always be worthwhile, especially if you're fast, but more than that can end up losing you more total trial time than the time you actually saved by using the trash skills on ads. Play around with this concept and see what works best for you and your group. If you're not score pushing, taking the extra time to swap out as many skills as necessary to make each individual fight quicker, despite a slower overall trial time, is probably the safest option for all content. So with that, the most common swaps on the arc that we will consider for trash involve running Cruxweaver Armor, Proximity Detonation, and Elemental Rage, all skills that will swap on the back bar. Cruxweaver is perhaps one of the most used flex skills for the Arcanist, typically run over Scalding Rune, in fights where you take constant ticks of direct damage. Every time you do, you get one free Crux, allowing you to to spend one GCD less on Flail and get one full extra second of Fate Carver on average. This results in a massive DPS increase if used efficiently in any fight but requires an ability to track your crux extremely well. In trash pulls, there will be smaller adds that will be untaunted and somewhat constantly hitting you and your group members, rocking this ability very consistently. Even in fights like Oak's hard mode or Reef Guardian hard mode, where you can consistently benefit from this crux gen, this will be worth running, as spending as much time casting Fate Carver as possible is the key to maximizing damage on this class in content. Because getting to Fate Carver as quickly as possible is so important in trash especially, we will maximize our damage in trash pulls by pre-buffing abilities, as opposed to actively laying dots in AoEs once the fight begins. And this is a topic that we will discuss near the end of the video in more depth. Proximity Detonation is a skill that can be pre-buffed out of combat that will deal increased damage based on the amount of targets hit. This includes all of the small adds that you encounter right at the beginning of a pull. With this in mind, the goal is to time proxy debt so that it explodes right as the encounter starts before anything dies, and doing so will result in a ton of AoE damage from this ability. And with that, perhaps one of the most misunderstood understood ultimates in the entire game, Elemental Rage is actually stronger than our Languid Eye per cast. 
What I mean by that is that one cast of the Destro ult will do more total damage than a cast of Languid Eye, and it will do so in a much larger radius. The benefit to running Languid Eye is that we can get about two Languid Eyes per one Destro, which makes Languid better for overall DPS. However, in trash pulls, Languid will a, not hit everything, and B, at some point you're going to want to save your ultimate for the boss, which means that you're limited to casting a certain amount of ultimates during these pulls anyway. For these reasons, Elemental Rage will do better in trash pulls, and slotting Languid Eye in the front bar for a little extra pen could be a worthwhile move. Likewise, if you're in a comp that requires you to front bar Languid so that you hit pen cap, you might as well slot Elemental Rage on the back bar to at least use at the beginning of a fight if you can get to 250 ultimate. It will be a small damage increase, but a damage increase nonetheless. This only works if you need extra pen on the front bar though. Don't ever do this over the Dawnbreaker Languid setup in optimized rating. Finally, though we've discussed the main bar setups that are run most commonly on the Arcanist in content, there are still so many skills that can be run to maximize your damage in individual encounters, or even help you build a better bar that fits your playstyle. I've labeled the rest of the relevant skills into four different categories. Skills for alternative weapon setups, such as bow back bar, skills for raw damage dealing, and skills for healing or survivability. The only weapon that hasn't really been discussed for the arc is the bow. There's no world where, even if we are running any other weapon on the front bar, that we'd replace our spammables for a weapon-based one, so the only consideration are the back bar abilities. Endless Hail is a go-to over Stampede or Wall when running a bow. This AoE will provide more overall DPS output than other dot alternatives such as Degen or Scalding Rune on its own, which makes it worth running. It also does its damage in a pretty large AoE radius, however, it will by no means end up being the strongest skill in this toolkit, only slightly outperforming skills like Scalding in single target situations. When opting for a bow in boss situations, you will usually do so for the sake of range and or burst damage, which makes the master's bow an incredibly strong option to run. This means that you would have to slot poison injection. The skill itself is a pretty decent damage over time effect, really doing its damage towards the end of a fight, but it's most relevant due to the set that we normally pair it with, which offers 330 weapon and spell damage to targets afflicted with poison arrow. Providing an increase in a stat line that increases the DPS of all of our sources of damage will be more preferable in shorter and burstier fights, as opposed to buffing only our direct damage in the VMA Greatsword with the Runeblade setup, or simply buffing Wall of Elements in the Fate Carver setup. Our next category, Skills for Raw Damage Dealing, will give us a list of flex skills that can be considered situationally meta over the listed bar setups depending on the fight. Starting with Rune of the Colorless Pool, this ability is a solid skill to be aware of for the sake of group DPS if your comp does not include an Arcanist support. The primary use of this skill is that it applies Minor Brittle and Minor Vuln for 20 seconds as a guaranteed proc. This is the longest source of either of these buffs that exists in the game currently, making it the easiest and most reliable source. If you don't have an arc support, you should probably include this ability on a DD. On that note as well, you can also slot Xena's Empowering Disc on the Arcanist Damage Dealer to provide minor courage when no arc support is in group, a must-have buff that was historically provided by the set Yolnikrin run on the tanks. Running this skill will be a slight personal DPS loss, but it will be an overall group DPS gain, as it will allow the main tank to drop Yoln in favor of different buff sets to further increase group DPS. Next up, though a bit niche, Elemental Susceptibility can be a strong dot to run when running a staff on the back bar if you have nothing better to use. The art gets a massive damage increase to all status effects, and Elisus keeps tremendous uptimes with burning, chilled, and concussed, making it worth about 3 to 4k DPS as a long 30 second ability. It also offers a long duration for Major Breach, which becomes necessary for portal type situations where the damage dealer will need to provide this debuff for themselves, like in VDSR Reef Hearts for example. In the Undaunted Tree, Mystic Orb provides more raw damage than any of the other flex dots such as Scalding Rune or Caltrops, and it provides the group with the must-have Combustion Synergy, which does a ton of damage and restores resources to the consumer. The only problem is that it lasts 10 seconds, and Orb is not really strong enough to be worth the amount of casts you'd have to spend. It's a good idea to have at least either one DD or one of your support run this skill for the sake of overall group DPS, but it will be a slight personal DPS loss. In the Assault Tree, the other morph of anti-cavalry Caltrops, Razor Caltrops provides the same amount of damage per second, but doesn't give as much overall value as anti-cavalry Caltrops due to its 10 second duration, as opposed to the other morphs 15. The skill is extremely useful though in solo or four man content for the sake of AoE Major Breach. When you don't have anybody to provide this buff for you, Razor Caltrops will end up being a must have, 
as hitting pen cap on all of your targets is one of the most important steps in doing good damage. Keep in mind though, for fights where there is only one target in need of breach, such as the Reef Guardian hard mode Reef Heart mechanic, you'll get more value out of a long single target skill like Elemental Susceptibility. The final category of skills to discuss are the ones that are going to increase your survivability in content. As a note, running any one of these skills will result in a damage loss, but that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes getting some more survivability into the toolkit is the best way to tackle challenging content. And no skill exemplifies that better than the other morph of exhausting Fate Carver. Pragmatic Fate Carver is perhaps the most popular ability in the game right now. This skill provides a massive damage shield while channeling, meaning that your primary source of damage is also your primary source of damage mitigation. It's kinda broken. In any progression scenario, running this morph will dramatically increase your survivability. I will say though, one element that often gets overlooked is that you lose a full second of damage with this morph, which doesn't really seem detrimental, but it adds up to be a pretty significant loss, especially in longer fights. You can lose anywhere from 5 to 10k DPS depending on how AoE oriented the fight is. The skill does good enough damage that the trade-off is usually worthwhile, but again, use at your own discretion. Evolving Runemen is a great heal to consider when you don't have anything to hit with Flail, as it provides a decent burst heal, a pretty strong heal over time, and generates Crux. In solo situations where you might need some sort of healing, such as VCR portals, this will be a strong option, as the healing provided overall is good in addition to the fact that it wouldn't really be a useless cast if you have to heal, again due to the Crux gen. You would be able to cast Flail one less time in a rotation and only lose a little bit of damage casting this skill over the alternative. This is opposed to a skill like Vigor, which would result in a completely useless skill cast in terms of damage, since the only function of the skill is as a heal. Curative Surge can be a strong healing option to consider for very specific fights. In situations where you do not have a healer, whether it be sweaty four-man scenarios or even 12-man situations that require you and your allies to handle a portal-style mechanic, this skill will be able to carry through almost any damage-intensive phase, being one of the absolute strongest heals in the game and allow you to do so as a damage dealer. Keep in mind though that the healing on this skill is distributed, meaning that the less people you are healing, the more the heal will actually tick for. In comparison, the fewer number of people you're healing, the more the heal will do because it won't be split between allies. In the Mage's Guild tree, Structured Entropy provides a nice balance between damage and survivability. This morph does just as much damage as a skill like Scalding Rune, but also gives a decent little heal over time. This is a go-to skill for longer fights where you shouldn't really need a burst heal per se, especially if you're experienced in that specific scenario, but where simply having some sort of healing would be necessary. The primary example that comes to mind is the VSS hard mode portal mechanic. Ideally, you don't want to sacrifice damage by slotting a heal if you can avoid it, and with enough practice and experience, Structured can be enough to get you through the fight. Finally, in the Assault Tree, both Morphs of Vigor have their use. Resolving Vigor is one of the strongest heals that any class has access to, period. Not only does it provide a massive heal over time, it also gives minor resolve, increasing physical and spell resistances by about 3,000. This doesn't sound like a huge deal, but this provides a noticeable increase in survivability. In any situation where you might have to perform mechanics away from healing, this is a great option for safety. The other Morph Echoing Vigor I have seen used quite often in sweaty 4 and 12 man situations, where you might opt to drop the healer altogether in 4 man, or only run one healer in 12 man. For example, if you drop the healer in 4 man, it's usually wise to have all 3 damage dealers slot echoing vigor, and if the group is experienced enough, this amount of healing will suffice for most content. Likewise, in 12 man content, a fight like the Orphic Shattered Shard, the second boss in Lucent Citadel, gives a pretty nasty dot. Echoing vigor can be stacked, and having all 8 damage dealers cast this before moving out results in this ability stacking stacking three to five times on every damage dealer, providing a ton of extra healing while spread so far apart. Nothing that we've discussed up to this point matters if you don't have a solid understanding in how to actually play the Arcanist. The reality is that, in the hands of an experienced and well-practiced player, getting 100k out of this class can be done with crafted gear and a phenomenal rotation. Understanding how to optimize the arc is important for maximizing your damage potential, but actually maximizing your damage is solely based on your understanding of the class and how it works, as well as practicing and mastering the Arcanist's timers, weaving, and overall rotation. So with that, this first section is going to discuss 
discuss all the fundamental elements in doing damage on the class so that you can understand how the static and dynamic rotations are built in the next section. We'll finish it off by discussing how we adapt these rotations to maximize our damage in real encounters. The arc is in a tricky spot this patch, where Rune Blades is by far the strongest single target option for the class, but Fade Carver is still going to be utilized dramatically in content. Luckily, the rotations share many commonalities, with the only distinct difference revolving around the spammables. Both Rune Blades and Fade Carver maximize their damage when we have three crux active. Rune Blades will not only do increased damage, but it will also gain increased crit chance per crux that you have active. For this reason, we want to keep three crux as often as we can, so we will only use Tentacular Dread to maintain the passives that we discussed a bit earlier, which can be done by activating it roughly once every eight seconds. This will ensure that our ult is genning properly so that it lines up with our exploiter procs. Fate Carver, though, requires a bit more mastery. This ability must be consumed with three crux. Using it with any less nukes the damage. When used correctly, Fate Carver will account for 40 to 45 percent of our overall DPS output. This means that we want to be using it as as often as possible, but the long duration means that some of our abilities might not line up nicely, leaving moments where we need to make decisions about whether or not it's worth reapplying an ability early or waiting until the end of Fate Carver to reapply it. It generally depends on the skill, abilities like Wall and Scholarship you want to have active while Fate Carver is channeling, but skills like Scalding, Fulminating, and Cloak we can allow to fully expire. As a generic rule, if an ability has less than two seconds of its duration before you are about to go into a Fate Carver channel, you can reapply apply it early. Otherwise, let it expire. And with that, one of the biggest mistakes I see players make in content, on console especially, is turning off their way of tracking Crux. The Rune Blades rotation requires three Crux be built in order to maximize the bonuses that we get with Tentacular Dread. In terms of both the damage of the ability itself and the increase in damage we get from its buffs when amplified by Crux. The Fade Carver rotation is a little trickier, as we can use Flail as a pseudo-spammable when ability timers have one or two seconds left. Hitting Flail twice before every beam is a common way of playing the class, but it's one that's going to lose you damage. Instead, we should use Flail dynamically. For example, if we are at one crux and a skill like Wall has one second left of its duration, we can cast Flail, then Wall, then Flail again, and then Beam, which gives Wall an extra tick of damage and still gets us to three crux. Tracking your crux actively allows you to use Flail dynamically, which will help get more damage out of your dots and help timers line up a bit better. Another massive element to the Arcanist's strong performance is our low costing ult and the ability to use heroism pots. We need to make sure that we are properly maintaining good ult gen by light attacking at least once every seven seconds, using our heroism potions on cooldown and consuming crux once every eight seconds. Doing so, will ensure that our languid eye lines up with the beginning of an off balance proc every single time, which ends up being a free 8% damage increase to one of the strongest ults in the game. You have to pay attention though, because you will have exactly 175 ult whenever the off balance proc goes off cooldown. So if you don't cast your ult the second it's ready, you'll lose out on this bonus. Outside of the rotation fundamentals, perhaps the next most important element to doing good damage is maximizing your damage done with your sets. Whatever set you run, it's important to make sure that you're tracking it and getting the most out of it. Both setups only have one set that you need to actively concern yourself with. For the Rune Blade setup, Null Arca is really unique, as maximizing damage with this set is purely based around getting it to proc as often as possible. To do this, you need to be somewhat aware of the cooldown, and ideally be spamming Rune Blades one second before it's ready to be proc'd again, to get it to proc instantly. This is pretty tough on console, but the way I figured out how to do this with no add-ons was to track the proc, and when it disappears, you know you have about four seconds until it's ready to be applied again, so we can cast three skills, and and then spam rune blades until it does proc again. Now, you don't want your dots and AoEs to fall off for the sake of Nolarka, so it's a little tough finding the balance. Simply maintaining a rotation will net you about 8k DPS with the set, but actively tracking and playing it this way can get you up to 14k DPS. That is a massive increase. In the Fate Carver setup, we need to make sure that we are maintaining Coral Riptide well. To do this, we will dump to about 35% stamina to start the fight and then attempt to alternate our shard and potion timers. I only like to take shards if I'm either gassed out on stam or right after two flails if my stam is a bit higher, since flail is so expensive and you're usually under 20% after every time you cast them. You almost never want to take a shard and potion together though unless you are almost completely out of stam, otherwise it will shoot up to above 40% and you'll lose some damage. The last rotational element to discuss is the class's weaving. In general, for good weaving, you need to master two main elements, the most important of which is casting skills as close to one second apart as possible, essentially casting abilities as soon as you're able to. 
When you have the timing down, you want to then attempt to place your light attack right before the skill cast, putting them as close together as possible. This will result in weaving that becomes unaffected by channeled casts, which narrows the window in which you have to queue a light attack in order for it to actually fire. Both morphs of flail have a 0.3 second channel, which means that window to queue a light attack in bar swap is a bit smaller. I do like to bar swap off of this ability whenever possible, since I can cast flail and then just spam the bar swap button a couple of times rapidly for a perfect bar swap cancel. Likewise, in the rune blades rotation, stampede is a little strange as it requires movement in order to weave normally. Casting the ability without any sort of movement will cause a lock where you are not able to light attack, bar swap, or cast a skill for a full second, which will slow down your weaving tremendously. A tap of the W key or a tiny wiggle of your thumbstick while casting stampede is enough to break this lock. And especially while running Highland Sentinel, you want to try to keep the movement extremely small so that you don't lose stacks. Finally, in the Fate Carver setup, weaving with a 5.4 second channel can feel very strange. Most of the time, I will just skip light attacking after Fate Carver altogether, especially while in Velothi. If you do this, you have to make sure that you hit the next light attack though. Otherwise, you risk losing ult gen, which will result in a pretty noticeable damage loss. The final way to add a little bit of damage to your parse is based on how you pre-buff. I've always argued in the past that PC 21 mil parses are mimicable on console, and this is held true for every class. For example, still on YouTube for update 40, Charles posted a Stamina Arcanist parse that hit 132k, and a player on Xbox NA named Kodak put up a 135k. However, if you are a console player, you need to look out for this pretty smart pre-buff set that was being used in some record pushes on PC when you could pre-buff with Resonating Glyphic's combat function. That set is Clever Alchemist. It gives over 600 weapon and spell damage for 20 seconds whenever you use a potion. Pre-buffing with skill swaps, that is, Channel Acceleration, Dawnbreaker, Stam Dumps, all of that is possible on console with a little finesse in practice. A Clever Alchemist parse straight up cannot be replicated on console though. If you are on PC, you should take advantage of this. Score pushing is all about these, for lack of a better word, exploits, figuring out niche ways that you can abuse the game mechanics in a legal way, essentially. There's no reason that you can't practice this concept on the 21 mil. If you are on PC, your pre-buff should involve a clever Alk Wizard setup. This is tough to do, and you have to go fast. Hit the dummy, pop a potion, reset it, then swap out of that setup. And then this is where you begin on console. Clever Alk should add no more than 1 to 1.5k total to the parse, so just expect to be a hair lower. Both rotations should start with 3 Crux to maximize damage with our skills that consume Crux early on in the fight. Then we can use Dawnbreaker, hit the well, pop a potion, and then begin each rotation's pre-buff. Getting into the actual rotations for the Arcanist, I'm going to truck through the static and dynamic rotations for both the Rune Blades and the Fate Carver builds. Starting with the static rotation for the Rune Blade setup, I built this roto to be extremely beginner friendly. I managed to hit about 130k with the static rotation, and our good friend Whiteson managed to hit an insane 135k with the dynamic rotation. That was from last patch though, so that means the potential for the Rune Blades roto sits closer to 130 38k in update 43. For this reason, I'd estimate the static roto to perform just 5 to maybe 8k less than the dynamic, which is kind of insane considering how little we pay attention to our null arca procs in this setup. This rotation takes notice of the fact that most of our timers are about 20 seconds long, with the exception of Stampede, which is 15 seconds, and Scholarship, which is 30. However, we mainly use Stampede for the Maelstrom buff, which lasts for 18 seconds, so we settle for a 19 to 20 second rotation that overcasts Scholarship a bit, but is very simple to perform. We place Stampede as close to the spammable portion of the rotation as possible to ensure that we get the max value out of the Maelstrom Greatsword while using the skills that it buffs the most, allowing it to fall off only only when we are reapplying dots. Finally, we will cast Tentacular Dread twice per rotation in order to ensure that we are getting the full value out of the passives Faded Fortune and Implacable Outcome. Faded Fortune is the passive that gives us 12% critical damage for 7 seconds when building or consuming Crux, so we have 6 seconds during the dot re phase between Dread, which will consume Crux, and Rune Blades, which will build them. Then the next main section where we cast Dread, spam times 10, then Dread, consumes with the first cast, then builds in the first 3 spammables, leaving 7 spammables, or 7 seconds, until we cast Dread again, keeping near perfect uptimes with this passive. Implacable Outcome requires Crux to be consumed once every 8 seconds to generate 4 ultimate. We only need to do this twice per rotation to still get our ulti to line up with our off-balance procs, so Dread at the end of the roto has 6 dots and 3 spammables, or 9 seconds between the next cast of it, which will happen 10 spammables or 10 seconds later. The only other important element to know about is that we will have 13 total casts of Rune Blades, and we try to crunch this in 
all together as much as possible to get as many procs of Null Arca off during this phase as we can. We are only ever on our back bar for no more than 3 seconds at a time, which means that we end up getting 10 to 11k DPS out of the potential 14k DPS that this set can provide, without really trying, which is awesome. The only skills that you need to track dynamically in this reto are Carve and Languid Eye, both of which we will try to cast in place of a spammable. However, if either needs to be reapplied, you are welcome to just add it in and continue the rotation as normal. As a final note for a little bit of extra burst at the end of the fight, once the dummy reaches about 1.5 mil, try to take a look at your timers and make sure that Stampede and Trap get reapplied if they are over halfway through their duration. Then hit Dread at 1 mil for our passive buffs and spam only with Rune Blades until the dummy dies. For the dynamic version of this rotation, being able to reapply skills as they expire will give us some more damage from both the skills that we allow to fall off for a few seconds in the static rotation and through our spammable and proc set by being able to use rune blades more, since we won't be overcasting other abilities as well. Outside of simply reapplying skills as they expire, we want to make sure that we are attempting to hit Tentacular Dread once every 8 seconds for the Faded Fortune and Implacable Outcome passives, and that we are tracking our proc set Null Arca. We will attempt to hit Rune Blades one second before the proc set is ready to try to time Rune Blades casts in a way that will cause the set to proc almost instantly. However, this is not at the expense of our dots. Should we have multiple skills expiring simultaneously, it's important to be aware of the priority of reapplication. That is, the skills that will be the most worth reapplying, whether it be related to the raw damage that they deal or the damage utility that they provide. That order goes Carve, Languid Eye, Trap, Stampede, Arnold Arca proc, Scholarship, Fulminating Rune, Cloak, and our 8 second Tentacular Dread buff. Getting into the Fate Carver rotation, starting with the Static Roto, I built this to be extremely beginner friendly. I managed to hit about 124k with the Dynamic Rotation and 119k with the Static. With more crit farming, I think both of these parses could pretty easily be 1-2k to higher, but it does suggest that the static roto should be no more than 5k off from the dynamic, especially considering that I did have to throw in a heavy attack in the static parse. Much like the rune blades rotation, the best compromise between these timers is an 18-19 to 19 second roto that undercasts wall a bit, overcasts scholarship, and keeps everything else maintained pretty well. The only weird part of the rotation is casting scolding rune between both flail and beam combos, which I put there just to make sure that there's enough room to capitalize on implacable outcome to ensure that our ult is lining up with the off-balance procs. Everything else gets integrated without having to really pay attention to it, setting up a pretty standard rotation that has a dot phase and then a spammable phase. Like with the other rotations, make sure that you throw your ult as soon as it's ready for that off-balance proc and try to pay attention to that stamina pool since we are in Coral Riptide. Make sure that you start somewhere around 35% stam and then try to stagger your potion and shard timers, only taking either when your resources are below 20%, but never taking them together unless you're under 10%. And finally, our last rotation to look at, the Dynamic Fate Carver rotation. I had a pretty exact flow of skills that I know I'd cast in the exact same order all the way up until about the second ultimate. You want to try to line up your timers so that you are at 3 crux with all your dots down and ready to beam right as your ult hits 175 where that off balance proc should be ready. If you have all of your dots cooking with an ultimate and a 3 crux beam during the off balance proc your damage skyrockets in this little burst window. If you follow the opening this should be pretty intuitive, especially if you follow that 2 second rule that we discussed earlier. Remember it's only worth reapplying a skill a little early before going into a beam if there are less than 2 seconds left of its duration. The only time that I ignore this rule is if that skill is Scalding Rune, and I'm in the middle of an off-balance proc. Getting your timers to line up this way though is only possible if you are using Flail as a dynamic spammable. Casting Flail to allow skills to fully expire is going to result in getting more duration out of your abilities which will help them line up better. I'll show some examples of this concept in the demonstration. As with any dynamic rotation, the goal is simply to reapply timers as they expire and use your spammables when nothing needs to be reapplied. However, should you run into the situation where multiple skills are expiring simultaneously, you should follow a priority of reapplication, that is the skills that will be the most worth reapplying, whether it be related to the raw damage that they deal or the damage utility that they provide. That order goes Languid Eye, Wall, Scholarship, Trap, Fulminating Rune, Deadly Cloak, and Scalding Rune. 
As a final note, try to pay attention to that stamina pool since we are in Coral Riptide. Make sure that you start somewhere around 35% stam, and then try to stagger your potion and shard timers, only taking either when your resources are below 20%, but never taking them together unless you're under 10%. While I maintain that the 21 mil is a great place to practice and learn about a class and its unique damage, content demands that you make some adaptations to the pure single target rotations in order to maximize the damage that you do in PvE encounters. For example, while while these rotations are great for long single target fights like the bosses in VKA or in Sunspire, they will not be the absolute most optimal way to go about burst oriented fights, especially AoE burst situations like trash pulls. In general, this rotation can be adapted to two main situations single target in AoE burst. Single target burst fights encompass entire boss fights or boss phases where it would not be worth reapplying any more dots or AoEs. In general, spammable damage accounts for nearly 50 to 60% of our overall DPS output in a single target situation. That is, skills like Rune Blades, Fate Carver, and the Flail Morphs. The only thing that makes dropping skills like dots in AoEs worthwhile is the total damage that they deal. For example, Fate Carver is our strongest source of burst damage in content, ticking for up to 45k three times in one second, resulting in a burst of up to 135k in just one second. Now remember, one second is worth one GCD, or essentially one cast. And when we compare this damage to one of the dots in our toolkit, Fulminating Rune, we know that Fulminating lasts for 20 seconds, ticking once every two seconds, its max hit is about 10k, and it also does a tick of damage in an AoE radius for about 37k. So if we multiply the dot value by 10 and then add the burst, we can see that one cast of Fulminating Rune is worth 137k. This doesn't even include the damage procced with Scholarship or the Rune Break Synergy. So, as long as we can wait 20 total seconds, one cast of Fulminating will do a little more damage than one second of our spammable. And this concept demonstrates why we run dots and AoEs in our setup at all. This is also the same reason that we don't want to reapply our dots early. If we do, we miss ticks of the ability that could have otherwise been spent on our spammable, and then we lose damage. Now, let's apply this concept within the context of a burst situation. If you can only damage a boss for 10 more seconds, we only get half the amount of ticks of a skill like Fulminating resulting in about 87k total damage done from fulminating in this window. However, if we cast Fate Carver, we can get 135k in that same cast window. As you can see, it becomes well worth letting this dot fall off in favor of casting our spammable in this situation. So when is this concept applicable? As a general rule, a single target burst phase encompasses about a 5 to a 10 second window that you have to do damage before you cannot damage a target anymore. This happens on every single boss fight in the game. For example, if a boss is under 10 million HP, this means that there are about 10 seconds or less left until the boss is dead, indicating a burst phase. If a boss is one or two mechanics away until it goes into a mechanic where they are invulnerable, this indicates a burst phase. An example might be Zalvaka before she ports, the dragons in Sunspire before they fly into the air, or Lylanar and Turlacil before they do their interrupt mechanic. If the boss has short damage phases that are a part of the fight structure, like Ohms in a Silent Sanctorum, these are burst phases. Finally, bosses with little to no health like the Spider in VHOP or the Snake in VRG are fights short enough to be considered full-on burst fights, which would still imply that it wouldn't be worth reapplying any dots or AoEs once cast. As a generic rule, if you cannot get at least half the duration of your dot or AoE, it's just not worth reapplying. There are some give and takes to this, but you can use this rule while you're starting to play around with this concept and fine tune it fight to fight. Once you are familiar enough with a fight, you can gauge when that value will be applicable. For example, it will be worth reapplying a couple of dots just before you hit a burst window a little early if they are going to expire soon. But if that window is open, you're kind of stuck with what you gave yourself in terms of preparation. For this example, assume that we are on a fight like Zalvaka. In this fight, she'll usually do three mechanics on the first floor before the first port. If you did not reapply some dots a little early in preparation for mech 3 by the time it comes along, you're best off spamming and just taking the L with what damage could have been. However, if you anticipate this and reapply any skills that will fall off during that burst phase one or two seconds early and then spam only when that phase happens, you maximize your damage. And with that, the biggest mistake I see players make revolves around how they conduct their trash damage. Each and every trash fight in the game is a burst type of fight. The adds usually have anywhere from 2 to 4 million health apiece for the high priority targets. Divide that by 8 damage dealers and that's about 400k damage that you need to do to a target each. Quick math says that your spammable will get you there far faster than any dot or AoE. Again, in this toolkit you have to wait 20 seconds to get 135k damage out of a skill like Fulminating Rune, as opposed to waiting only 1 second to get that same damage from Fate Carver. Why use that skill? 
kill in the middle of a trash pull if your spammable is going to get you 135k damage in one second. The key to maximizing damage in trash is by pre-buffing, casting skills between pulls and out of combat. In fact, the quicker we can get into our Fate Carver cast, the better. This means that if you get the full duration of your beam on a trash pull and the adds are almost dead, you want to finish them with Flail so that you can start the next trash pull immediately in your Fate Carver cast. You rarely want to cancel your beam at the end of the pull to apply this concept, but doing so will help with burn goals, such as nuking the disruptors in Sanity's Edge before their enrage mechanic. In fact, Flail isn't even worth the cast for Abyssal Ink if your group's burn is high enough. So between trash pulls, we want to cast skills like Cloak, Scholarship, Cruxweaver, and Proxy Dead. But when the fight starts, we only want to cast Wall, Flail only is necessary to get to three Crux, and then cast Fate Carver. And we can finish a pull with Flail if we get the full beam channel and the adds are low health by the end of it. If everyone in your group does this, especially with an AoE spammable, your group's trash damage will increase tremendously. Thank you so much everybody for checking out the video. As always, if you found the video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and let me know in the comment section below if you have any questions. I pride myself on responding to every single comment, so feel free to test me on that statement. Be sure to join the Discord to get access to the full written guide for this build. The written guide has nearly 30 pages of information information, most of which is in this video, but the written guide's an easy way to control F your way to any topic that you might still feel a little uncomfortable on after watching. Likewise, I'm on Twitch, Twitter, and Patreon, so be sure to check me out and shoot me a follow on those platforms. The support is seriously appreciated. And on that note, a special shout out and thank you to all of my current patrons, Clyde, Carla, Larry, Alberg, Joseph, and Ook, thank you so much for your support, my friends. It's because of you that this content is made possible. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your support. It means the world. And thanks to all of you as well for all of your love and support. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next one.